There is a people that lives at the brink of the desert, on the line between the ancient, rugged, rocky canyons and the ever-shifting sand dunes. They live one day at a time, holding the sands at bay with the precious oasis given them by God, the one they worship. At the center of the village is a tall flower made from stone. It is the memory of color and beauty amidst the barren landscape, the echo of life in a rocky shell. Every morning at dawn, they rise at the call to prayer from high atop the stone flower, just the same every day as it should be. On the first morning of every week, the tribe offers stone tears, for this is what God wants, their tears. In return, he gives them peace in their minds and love in their hearts and water to sustain their bodies. So it has been taught and so they believe. The balance is perfect and must be maintained. A story was murmured, passed down from years past, of a man who went into the desert and returned, saying he saw the flower as it really was, not a stone, but a thing alive. He spoke of God in a new way, as none had heard for generations. He spoke of visions and colors and movement and flowing tears. But his people did not understand. They knew the God they served was perfect and faithful, and that in him there was balance. How could they seek more than that? Would he not find them ungrateful? The story was foolish and dangerous. The tribe was careful to remember God's blessings and not put him to the test. But one day, a certain boy hears the story and cannot believe that it is foolishness. What if there is something more? something they had lost, something about God they did not understand.
To leave the village in spite of the tribe's objections was to offend the family, to surrender to the sand and the sun, and perhaps to upset the very balance between God and man. But for the boy to stay is for him to be held captive to ignorance and hollow tradition, to wallow in a pool of water knowing full well that it is only a mirage over sand. As he begins to flee the village, he comes to the stone flower, the symbol of all he is running from, the symbol of God that has become more than God himself, if he existed at all. Before anyone can stop him, he begins to chip away at its stalk harder and harder, then to push on it with all his strength until the old, brittle, salty rock starts to crumble and crack. Finally, he comes crashing down, down to the ground, shattering into a million tiny, worthless pebbles. Tears that the flower cries, melting under the sun and becoming the nothing they have always been. The people come then, running, shouting, enraged at the boy. They seize him, rip his clothes, show his skin to the sky. They throw him into the desert, cast him upon the sand of which they had so recently been loath to leave him. But what God is a God that cannot be questioned? And what God is a God who cannot tell an offering? wanders over endless dunes. The only change he can sense is village growing smaller and smaller on the horizon past. But he does not look back. The sun looks down on him and on the sand with indifference. The boy stumbles down into the meager shade of one dune and up over the crest of the next, each step wearying him further. As the gritty sand clings to his sweaty flesh, he begins to realize that he does not know where he is going, nor even for what he is searching. The wind speaks gently to someone, 
someone else whom the boy cannot see, someone who probably does not even exist, leaving him even more alone than before. He remembers the village, the reason for the village. It had what he needed. It had what everybody needed. The reason anyone chooses to stay anywhere is because it has what they think they need. The village had water and comfort and companionship, and he left all that behind. When light moves between hot and cold air, the warm air over a dune and the cool air in the morning sky, for example, it bends, reflecting some things where there should be nothing but sand. Without enough water, the human body ceases to function properly, and in an environment of intense heat, the symptoms are magnified. Perception is no longer reliable. It can be difficult to tell where a mirage ends and a reality begins. All of a sudden, in front of him, the boy sees what he's been looking for for so long. Alive, free, diverse, but stable, structured, coincident. People in harmony with their environment, with each other, with God. He runs toward it, and it moves away. Always one dune farther away, but he reaches the next peak. He knows it must exist. He could not imagine something this born, this perfect. Still it moves farther and farther from him, eluding his grasping fingers and thirsty eyes, away across the dark and sand, and into the swift setting sun. The desert is about coming to the end of oneself, about arriving at a place where we realize how small we are and how little we have. And even in the desert, sometimes it takes a long time to see that. Sometimes we have to be reminded of it over and over again. The sun has set, but no moon has risen, rejected, alone, exhausted, undone. 
The boy tumbles down the sandy slope before him, letting the warm sand wrap him in its rough embrace. He is at the end of himself. There is not a grain of strength or hope left in his body or soul. And in despair, he calls out to the one he sought, the God he questioned, becoming his only possible answer. And then he is there, not as a person, but as a presence, a rippling, awful, wonderful light, close, but infinitely far away, tiny, but infinitely huge, a flower full of color and light, 
terrible and beautiful, ever-changing, but always the same, full of majestic splendor, but also of love, deep and personal and intimate, more than water, more than peace, more than companionship. This is what the boy needs, and this is the God his people had gradually forgotten, slowly making him into a flower of stone. The boy weeps, offering what is most precious to the one who has found him. This is more than a mirage. It is more than real. And the boy weeps. He does not know how much time has passed. Maybe moments, maybe days. He is thirsty and the sun is hot, so he walks. Hours pass. Perhaps the sun sets and rises again. Perhaps more than once, perhaps many times. He does not know. He knows only of the God he has met, the God he must tell his people about. So he walks. The boy's people are wary of him. When he is spotted on the horizon, when he comes closer, when he enters the village, they gather around him to hear his apology, or maybe more weary rebellion. Instead, though, he tells them of the world he saw, world of balance and of God, beautiful, terrible, transforming, sustaining, dynamic, consistent, and they believe him. He tells of his tears, real tears and what they mean, and they understand him. They do not think him foolish or haunted by a mirage or crazed by the sun. They start to realize who the God they serve really is. And he asks them to help him remember into the future. And as they worship with real tears, they gather the wet sand and mix it with stones. And they build a sculpture of the boy's vision to remind them of their true God. And the boy sculpts it himself, delighted at its realism. And as they step back, the sun hardens the monument in the center of their village, a stone flower. <laughs> 